Today is Remembrance Sunday. I don't know a whole lot about the history of why some Presbyterian congregations observe this day, but I suspect it arose out of the very human need to honor our loved ones, to remain connected to those dear to us who have passed on. As such, Remembrance Sunday might be something of a departure from our tradition's official theology, which for centuries has rejected any notion that might venerate saints. Not that we're actually venerating saints in the way other Christian traditions do, but still, historically our tradition has tried to put a great distance between itself and the veneration of saints by rejecting even the hint of the appearance of saints in worship. No doubt, John Calvin is spinning in his unmarked grave with the thought of us remembering and honoring our loved ones now passed on All Saints Day, which is also All Souls' Eve. And I said, great, let him spin. No doubt his bones could use the exercise. Sometimes what we need as humans is more important than official doctrine. And one of the gifts of the ecumenical movement is that we can learn from and borrow from traditions that are not our own. So... I will be spending time today remembering loved ones now past, and, and I will be honoring those who I don't know, but whose work and legacies have touched me. I will do this especially when we take communion, because communion is a meal that is meant to call to mind the great heavenly banquet. When we're joined at table in the fullness of time with saints and sinners, the, the bold and the brokenhearted, now this is true even in the sacraments reformed and Protestant iterations. Remembering the faithful departed and loved ones now past is something that I do every year on the first Sunday in November. Here at Montclair Presbyterian Church, we've used an ofrenda, an altar of sorts, upon which, during worship, we place photos, mementos of our loved ones who have died. In my past congregations on Remembrance Sunday, we've read the names of those in the congregation who have passed away during the preceding year. These are good ways to remember and to honor the gift of having known the community of love and faith that has formed us. But I'm aware that things are a little different this year. This year, most of us, me included, are not so much remembering, but are looking to the future with a certain amount of apprehension. And not even the distant future. I'm talking about the day after tomorrow, if you are watching this on Sunday, November 1st. We have an election upcoming. And it is an important one. And depending upon what happens, the days and weeks that follow the election may be more important yet. If you're like me, you are worried about violence on the streets and about disputes in the courts that could drag this thing on for quite some time. To borrow and edit and rewrite a quote from Thomas Paine, tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. These are times that try the human soul. What I want to say then is that on this Remembrance Sunday, we might do well not just to remember those who have loved and who have inspired us, but also to consider how we might be remembered by those we love and those we might hope to inspire. This is why I asked Siwan to read to us from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, where Moses gives what our Jewish friends call the Shema, which is the Hebrew word for listen, as in listen is real, or Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one God, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Remember these commandments and talk about them with your children. Later, as the passage goes on after the part that Siwan read to us, the reader is told, when your children ask you about all these things, tell them the story about how God freed us from bondage in Egypt. This passage is forward-looking. It's all about making sure future generations know the goodness of God and the story of how God intervened in human history to save an enslaved people. And I invite you to enter into the next days and weeks and maybe even months, this upcoming season of uncertainty, with the same forward-looking spirit. There may be no new commandment to pass along, and telling stories may not be what is needed right now, but how will you be remembered? What will your actions and your words teach any children that may be watching, either because you are a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or a neighbor or a friend? How will you be remembered? I hope it will be said of you that you voted. And if it can be said of you that you were active in sending postcards and making phone calls in support of the democratic process, then your memory surely will be a blessing. And if the election's results are slow to emerge and if there is a violent response either to the uncertainty or to a result that some deem unsatisfactory, 
Will you be remembered for your commitment to nonviolence? If there is any suggestion that the will of the people is not being honored, will you speak up on behalf of democracy using whatever platform is available for you, and will you be remembered for it? If, like me, you want very much to see a new president inaugurated on January 20th, and if the election goes your way, will you be remembered for being gracious in victory? If the election does not go how I think most people in our congregation want it to, want it to go, will, will you redouble your commitment to speaking out on behalf of those who will suffer in the second Trump term? The poor, women, immigrants, people of color, LGBTQ plus folk. If you have privilege, will you use your privilege in a way that strengthens and supports those who do not have such privilege? Will you be a light shining in the darkness? Will you be salt that flavors the earth? Will you be a city built on a hill and shining from that hill? Will you love your neighbor? And will you pray even for those whose political proclivities feel like an offense against everything you hold dear? How will you be remembered? And how will I be remembered? This is not an easy season. I will keep you in prayer, and I hope you will spare a good thought and a prayer for me as well. As we live into this extraordinary moment, may the Holy One be with you and with me, and may God's Spirit move in us and among us so that our memory will be blessed and eternal. Amen.